illustration can have the power to move people and create conversation, create dialogue. I have done a lot of teaching and I've put together a program that actually talks about the things that art can do in culture. It can, it can heal, it can, it can hurt people, it can be a form of, of uh, political, you know, political commentary. Illustration can uh, affect people on an emotional and visceral level. I think it can really have power. My uncle was an illustrator, and his name was Robert Kuntz, and his uh, motto was art for education. So when I was young, I realized that art could serve a function in the culture. Illustration was a, a completely incredible and legitimate form of art. When I went to art school, it was more of a trade school. I, to this day, have never had an art history class, which is kind of shocking. I mean, I wish I had. But when I was younger, my friends and I used to go to Europe and we used to go to all the galleries and I just remember being completely blown away by, first of all, the, the, the beauty of the originals and also these works that I really knew nothing about. I mean, it was a complete learning experience. When I saw the originals, for example, Johannes van Eyck, the altarpiece, the beauty of the, of the work, the masterful way that uh, these painters painted. I mean, you know, and they, the, the paintings seemed to shine. I just felt like, a, like I was a big sponge and I was just absorbing everything. When I receive a commission, I typically get a manuscript or if it's a book jacket, I'll read the book. So I try to immerse myself in as much information about the subject as possible. And then I start to think about how can I take the germ of the article or the story or whatever and create something that's visually arresting that relates to the story or the book and somehow, you know, in some way attracts the viewer, if it's a magazine cover, for example, but also maybe provides a different way of seeing what the article is about. And also, I have to say that when I'm working for different magazines, I always consider the audience. For example, if it's something, let's say for Time magazine, I know it's about the news, I know that I'm trying to be as direct as possible, um, and, and, to, and still to create an arresting image. If I'm doing something for Rolling Stone, it can be looser. The cover, No Photos Please, was a commission by The New Yorker by, from Francoise Mouly, and she asked uh, a number of artists, I think I don't, I never quite know how many she asked, but the, the issue was about celebrity and the nature of celebrity. And so they wanted to do a cover that reflected the subject, but wasn't necessarily specific. It wasn't necessarily a picture of Kim Kardashian, for example. So I thought, who is probably the most famous, <laughs> one of the most famous women in history? And I thought the Mona Lisa doing this no photos, please idea. And so I sent the idea. I also sent her the idea of the Statue of Liberty doing that, but somehow I think she and the editor picked the, the uh, Mona Lisa, and I'm glad they did because I think it ended up as a successful cover. For the Women's March, I went with a friend and we created a couple of posters. I didn't know quite what to do, so I just I repurposed some images that I already had and I added some type, and we printed them out pretty big. I think that People label me as a feminist, which is fine with me, but I think that uh, I'm just concerned that everyone has the same rights and freedoms as anyone else. And that has to do with women and minorities. I just think that it would be a much better world if the playing field was level. It's really just about autonomy for our own bodies. Last year, in 2023, the United Nations did a survey and discovered that nine out of 10 people in the world has a fundamental bias against women. I think this is profound. It, and this was the germ of an idea. I thought, how many, how many women have been forgotten? And 
as, as it is sometimes with ideas, you know, they, they kind of mull and they, <laughs> they bake and then they change form. And then later, as the pandemic started, or just actually right before the pandemic, I started thinking, I'd love to do a project on interesting sayings and maybe do projects, you know, do a portrait of who said it. And the first thing was Saint, a Saint Abby, who is in the show, and she was a mother superior in Scotland, came to find out that the Viking marauders were going to come and rape and kill them all, all of them, her sisters. And so she cut off her nose, and that's where the saying to cut off your nose to spite your face comes from. So I thought to myself, you know what, why don't I just do portraits of exceptional women? Original Sisters has to do with uh, portraits that I painted of women I thought had some kind of an interesting story. It's a celebration of women who I think should be household names. It was clearly important for me to, to show as many diverse women as possible because we've always been here, we've always been doing you know, great things. We've always contributed to the arts, to science, to culture. We've always done that. You know, many have fallen through the cracks and deserve to be known. I wasn't a judge of morality. So in the same way that famous men have been depicted throughout history, I've included some real rebels. So I've inc I included a bank robber who robbed a bank because she was so incredibly poor she had to take care of her mother. You know, so I included pirates, like women with, with massive power. So, so for me to ascribe morality or, you know, it, that wasn't my, that wasn't what I wanted to do. That's up for people. That's, you know, people can decide whether she was necessarily good or necessarily bad. It doesn't matter. So what I didn't do is I didn't go back to what I typically do, which is more caricature. I wanted to do something really respectful because I was dealing with historical nonfiction. I mean, these were real women and, and I just, I wanted the information to be as important as the painting. I did feel a sense of community in depicting these women, and also I felt that every day, this is gonna sound really corny, but every day I was spending with, this one, with one woman and discovering her and being able to depict her, and there was something, um, not even, I guess, soothing about that. The visual research I got wasn't always readily available. I mean, in some cases, there were great photographs, and I just had to use the photograph, making it as realistic as possible, as true to life as possible. But also, sometimes I had to also respect that, it, you know, there, there's a copyright for the photographer, so I had to keep that in mind for the more modern women. And for, for the older ones, um, for example, Queen Sophie Charlotte, that was an interesting one because there, she was most likely the first British black royal, not Meghan Markle. She was a little bit more difficult because I had to, of course there were no photographs, but there were etchings, and there were really interesting etchings. And I knew a couple of things. I knew back then they would have, everybody would have had white face, you know. So even if she had darker skin, everybody, they all had, you know, very toxic white makeup. So I wanted to try and depict her as closely as she probably would have looked. Obviously, I, I take artistic license because there, there's just no way to know what, the, what the, these people actually looked like. It was an interesting thing to do during the pandemic because not only did it somehow make me feel like I had accomplished something, like the day wasn't a waste, but I also, just in researching these incredible women, and some of the things they had gone through, and I thought I would never have the strength to go through what some of them have gone through. We're being asked to put a mask on and stay at home. That's nothing, you know, compared to some of these incredible stories of tenacity and bravery. It helped me move through the pandemic for, for those reasons. It was, it was, it was just, I'm so glad I, I, I did that. Because I set out to do one a day, it didn't give me time to second guess anything. Vivian Westwood, who was a later addition, and she was a crazy designer, like amazing, outrageous designer. 
And I thought, I'm going to put lime green in the background. And I put lime green in the background. I was like, ah, what am I going to do with this lime green background? And if it was something, if it was a project, if it was an illustration job, of course I would have to tone it down or worry about it. And But this case, it's like, no, lime green. She would have done it. And um, so I think I was channeling channeling the women as I was doing it. And I always say about this project, and I'm not being humble, this is not about me. This is this this project has never been about me. And that's why I'm a, I was able to just, you know, to, to try to channel the subjects and do what I thought was best to depict what how they were in the world and what they accomplished. To date, I think I've painted 453 or 454. I have a backlog of women I'd like to paint. I think I have at least 200 more. But this is, project is a love story. It's a thank you to women on whose shoulders I stand.